Welcome to the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that for over 50 years has been changing lives through God's unconditional love and grace. God has declared that He wants nothing but good for you, thoughts of peace. But you have to cooperate. You have to seek Him. And notice it says that you will seek Him and find Him when you search with all of your heart. And now, here's Andrew. All right, what I'm going to talk about, we'll all uh, speak on whatever God wants us to, and it'll all fit together. It always does. But I have really felt impressed to talk about how to hear God's voice and for you to tune your hearing to be able to hear God's voice. And the very first thing that I want to say about this is just to try and emphasize how important it is and what a privilege it is to have God Almighty speak to us and it's not meant to be a rare occurrence. It's meant to be normal. You know, over in Isaiah chapter 30, I believe it's around verse 21, it says that you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk thou in it. And that was prophesying what would happen in the new covenant. He had just been rebuking them and saying, I've forsaken you, I've turned you over because of this, but there's coming a day where I will draw you back and you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk thou in it. And I tell you, God intended to direct our lives. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, Jeremiah was lamenting the fact that the Israelites were going into bondage and that they were going to uh, be in captivity. And he had just talked about how could this happen to the people who were the apple of God's eye, the people who at one time were favored like nobody else on the planet. And he answered his own question in verse 23 by saying, but, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. And the reason that we get into trouble is because we do it our way, us and Frank Sinatra. <laughs> I did it my way. I believe that in hell there's probably a reoccurring loop that song playing about, I did it my way. And that'll be torment. Really, just about every problem that we have comes because we do things our way, because we don't listen to the voice of God. The only exception that I'd make to that is persecution. You can be persecuted when you're doing everything God's way. So you could have some trouble and some problems persecution, but most of our trouble comes from the fact that we are not hearing the voice of God and not following in His leadership. And I think that it is so, well, let me say it this way, it's so uncommon for people to hear the voice of God and to be led by God that most people don't even look at this as being normal. They think that you're weird. You know, here we are at this Bible conference, and I know that you all came to hear from the Lord, and so this won't sound strange to you, but if I was on just a secular television station and talking about that God spoke to me, God told me to do this, God said all of these things, did you know that the average secular television program, a news program or something like that would think that you are absolutely crazy to, to claim that God speaks to you? But everything that you see here, God spoke to me about this. God showed me this building in Karlsruhe, Germany, is where I saw this building. And I came back and designed it based on what I saw in Karlsruhe, Germany. And he spoke to me. And he showed me things. God told us to get this property. God led us. Everything around here, it's because God has spoken to me. Some of you have heard me say this, but right before my mother died, she was asking about things. I was telling her about what's going on all over the world. And she you know, didn't want me to get lifted up with pride. And so she said, Andy, you know it's God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know it's God. And she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> and it's just absolutely true. And I admit it. I mean, really, all I've done is seek the Lord and God just speaks to me. And any good thing that has ever happened in my life came because God willed it. God delights in the prosperity of his servant. God wants to bless the work of our hands. But you have to cooperate with Him. And when we do things our own way is when we get into all of the trouble that we get into. So I'm just trying to emphasize how important it is to be able to hear the voice of God. 
You know, a passage of Scripture that is familiar to many of you, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will listen to you in the next verse. And you will seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. So this says that God has perfect plans for your life, but those next two verses show that you have to seek him. You have to be receptive. God's will does not automatically come to pass in your life. If it was only up to God, every person in here would be 100% healthy. You'd never have any sickness. You would never have any poverty. You would never have any depression. Now, you can't control other people completely, and so you will be persecuted. The Scripture says all those who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. So you could have some problems, but they would be from the outside. You wouldn't have sickness. You wouldn't have poverty. You wouldn't have depression. You wouldn't have anxiety, worry, and fear if it was just up to God because God has declared that He wants nothing but good for you. Thoughts of peace. But you have to cooperate. You have to seek Him. And notice it says that you will seek Him and find Him when you search with all of your heart. If you are just saying, oh God, would you please speak to me? But if He doesn't show up in the next five minutes, you got something else to do. And so you just disengage and go somewhere else. That's not how it works. I'm going to be sharing with you. I've got a lot of sessions this week, and I'm going to be sharing with you some of the things that the Lord has spoken to me and how he's shown me how to listen to him and how to respond to him. And I am not claiming that I do all of this perfectly. I don't think anybody does anything perfectly this side of heaven. We are all still learning. The Apostle Paul says, I haven't obtained yet. And so I'm not saying I do it perfectly, but I can say that all of the good things that are happening in my life are happening because God. I've learned how to hear the voice of God and respond, and God has spoken things to me, and praise God, it's just changing my life, and it's changing the lives of other people. We talk about Hannah Teredes. It was totally healed of an incurable disease, given less than a week to live, and here she is, how many years later? 13 years later, she's in ROTC, joining the uh, military, amen, and she wasn't going to live for a week. We got the McDermott boys that were healed, and on and on we could go. I bet you there's many, many testimonies right here of great miraculous things that are happening. And it's because of being able to hear the voice of God. God is not silent. And again, we're in a religious Christian meet meeting, and so most of you would have a different answer than you would have out on the street if somebody had asked you. But you know what? The average Christian even, they don't hear the voice of God. It's like it's seldom. It's rare. And yet that's not what the Scripture teaches. Let me share some verses with you on this. In John chapter 10, this was Jesus speaking. In verse 1, it says, Verily, verily. You know, anytime you say verily, verily, that means truly, truly. Everything Jesus said was true. But if he has to start it with saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, it's because what he's about to say is so hard to believe that some people would think he must not mean what it says. So he starts off by saying, I'm telling you the truth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. Notice it says the sheep, the people who truly belong to the Lord, hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name. That means that he speaks to them. He knows your name. The Bible says the very hairs of your head are all numbered. If you take Psalms 139, it says that there isn't a thought that comes to your head that God doesn't know. He knows you frontwards and backwards. It says you can't ascend into the heights and get above him. You can't go into the depths. He's everywhere. He possesses you. And then the verses right after that, Psalms 139, talk about in your mother's womb, he possessed you. And you, all of your days were written in his book before you were ever born. That is the answer about is abortion 
uh, permitted or not. Some people think, well, it's just a hunk of tissue. No, you were possessed in your mother's womb and God had already written down all of the things that he wanted you to do while you were still in your mother's womb. Abortion for any Christian ought to be a non-issue. And I'll just go as far as to say, <laughs> I hate to... I hate to run people off on the very first night. <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean about this, but this is just the scriptural thing. And if you vote for people who support abortion, you are an accessory to murder. Amen. That's the way that God looks at it. God loves you. I'm not saying he doesn't love you, but I'm saying that this is what the Bible says, and anybody who has an opinion different, that is because you don't value what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says right here. He knows you. He calls you by name and leads you out. And when he uh, putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And, and a stranger they will not follow but will flee for him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Did you know Jesus was teaching that if you are truly his child, you know his voice, you hear his voice, and he even goes as far as to say that you should not know the voice of a stranger, which it's in this same chapter just a few verses down where he says in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief, talking about Satan, comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so Satan is the thief that he's talking about, the stranger. And this is saying that we shouldn't know the voice of the devil. And yet I have people come to me all the time and say, you're talking about God speaking to you and God said something. How do you hear the voice of God? I just can't hear the voice of God. And the devil says, I'm never going to hear the voice of God. And the devil says this and the devil says that. And they can hear the devil just fine, but they can't hear God. <laughs> this is completely contrary to what Jesus is saying. If we are his sheep, it is normal for you to hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. God is speaking to you constantly. Now, some of these things I'm just going to say, and it'll take throughout the entire week, I'm going to verify it and show you why. Uh, many people right now are saying, well, I understand what you're saying, but that's not my experience you do hear the voice of God. You just don't recognize it as the voice of God. And I'm going to show you why we have trouble recognizing that. But the scripture here is saying that God does speak to you. It is not a problem of God not speaking. It's the problem of us not hearing or paying attention, discounting the voice of God. But if you could understand this, just think of, just think of the benefits let me show you another verse over here in John chapter 16. In John chapter 16 and in verse 13, and he says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Think about what would happen in your life if you heard the voice of God, and this is saying that the Holy Spirit's job is to show you things to come. If you improved your relationship, your hearing to the point that God could tell you things that are going to happen before they happen, what would that do to you? I know most of us have never even thought of this because we just think this is out of the question. You can't know things. How do you know what's going to happen? Matter of fact, you'll find religious people that'll even write songs about further along, we'll know all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. You're going to just do without now, but someday we'll know all about it. That's not what the scripture teaches. Some people will say, well, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's a quotation from the Old Testament. How could that be wrong? Because in the New Testament, the next verse says in verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. And then down in verse 14, you, the natural man cannot understand the things of the Spirit. They have to be spiritually discerned. 
So verse 9, when it says that no man has seen, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, that's just talking about in your human self, in your carnal self, you cannot hear and discern the things of God, but God has revealed them unto us, talking about the born-again believers by His Spirit. We are not supposed to be without a clue. We are supposed to know what's happening. We're supposed to have God speak to us. God is supposed to tell you things. You know, Daniel Amstutz is sitting right down here. Daniel, come up here. Have you got a mic that I could use for Daniel? Hey, Daniel, come up here and tell them about when you were in Hawaii and God spoke to you and told you something was going to happen and tell that story. Yeah, my wife and I were celebrating our anniversary and we were actually invited to teach uh, a worship seminar over there. And when the pastor found out that it was our anniversary, they graciously took us out for the day, surprised us completely because we didn't go over there for that. We went over there to teach. And uh, that night we went to a lovely restaurant and afterwards it was just pouring rain. I mean, if you've been to Hawaii, you know that tropical rain that happens in Hawaii. And we were uh, on our way home after eating a lovely meal together with the senior pastor and his wife. And uh, all of a sudden, we're going around a corner, and the pastor yells out, oh my God, he's in our lane. And coming at us was a huge vehicle in our lane, and none of us had any time to do anything but just say the name Jesus. Well, what was interesting about this was that morning when I got in the car, I just heard this, you're going to be in a head-on collision. And I turned to the window and I just softly said, nope, I take authority over that. That's not going to happen in Jesus' name. Didn't say anything to my wife. Didn't say anything to the pastor and his wife. Found out later, Tracy had said the, heard the very same thing and very uncharacteristic, didn't say anything to any of us. <laughs> Are you saying that she would normally tell oh, you what she thought? Oh, yes, thinks? she would tell me what she thought, especially <laughs> about that. And she took authority over it and didn't say anything to us until later. So as the pastor says the vehicle's coming in our lane, we just yelled out the name Jesus. And the only thing I can tell you to liken it to in the physical realm, it was like in those space movies when you go uh, into hyperspace. It was like, wow. And we looked behind us, and the car was still in our same lane on the other side. Praise God for the voice of Jesus. Yes, praise God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's awesome, brother. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Isn't that great? Jamie and I had a similar thing happen, except the Lord didn't speak to me in advance. But we had a car that the brakes went out on it, and we were driving to a... Uh, Bible study, and I didn't have enough money to get the brakes fixed. I mean, it would take me two and three and four times as long a distance as normal to stop. And so I had to, there was many a time that I'd come to a red light and I'd just make a right hand turn because <laughs> I couldn't stop. And uh, anyway, we were driving over to Walsh, Colorado, and we were going 60 miles an hour and we came over a hill and there was a hundred cows on the road. And I just go, oh, I didn't say a thing. And Jamie was reading, and she looks up, and she goes, Jesus. And boom, we were on the other side of those cows. And we looked in the rearview mirror, and they were still there, but we, we were through them. I don't know what happened. You know, you, you'd think that if your faith is good enough for that, you could at least have enough faith to get your brakes fixed. <laughs> But anyway, my point is, see, God spoke to Daniel. God will show you things to come. God told me one time not to go on an airplane, and there was no reason not to do it, but I didn't do it, and the plane crashed and killed everybody on board. God spared my life. I'm thinking of another example of John G. Lake, who had a very similar experience to what uh, Daniel was talking about, and he was driving up a mountain road, and it was on a steep curve, left-hand curve, and God told him to pull into the left lane and park. Did you know on a steep mountain road, that's not smart to park in the left lane. A, tr a car coming down in that left lane would hit you. But, but instead of arguing, see, I, I'm still growing. I'm not where I need to be. I probably would have done it, but it would have been 15, 20 minutes later 
But within just seconds after he pulled into the left lane in park, a log truck came down that road and it was out of control. It couldn't stop. And it was over in his lane. And if he hadn't have done what God said, they would have collided and have uh, fallen off the road. See, God speaks to us, but most people just aren't listening. But think about what it would benefit you if God was to tell you that the way you're living is not right. And don't misunderstand some of the things I'm saying. I'm not trying to cast stones at anybody, but I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you are struggling in any area, it's because somewhere you have not been listening to the voice of God. Or if you heard the voice of God, you didn't obey it. Because God's will for you is good. It's peace to give you an expected end, a hope and a future. It's God, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of His servant. Over in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, it says, Fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants you to prosper. If you aren't prospering financially, emotionally, in relationships, or whatever area, it is not because God doesn't have a good plan for your life. And it's not because God doesn't have the ability and the power to get you where you need to be. It's because some way or another, we have done our own thing and we have not listened to the voice of God. And I don't believe that there's a single exception. Some religious people will come along and say, oh no, God puts troubles in your life. God might make you sick to break you and to humble you. That's not what the scripture teaches. I disagree with that. I break from that. A hundred percent. God is not the one making you sick. The Bible says that Jesus is the express image of the Father. Of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John chapter 14. And yet you never find Jesus putting sickness on anybody. You never find Jesus telling someone that you haven't suffered enough. You haven't learned your lesson yet. You've got to suffer some more. And if Jesus truly represented God the Father like He said He did, well then He never showed Him putting sickness on anybody, leaving sickness on anybody. That is not God's will. God has a good plan for your life, and it's better than what I believe any of us are living. God's plan for us is greater than what any of us have ever tapped into. And you know, one of the things that is keeping that from happening is our inability to hear the voice of God and to follow His directions. And so we go out and do it our way, and that's what causes all of the problems. Again, I'm not throwing stones at anybody. You can't unscramble eggs. Amen. And sometimes you just have to say, thank you, Jesus, for loving me in spite of what I've done. And you just pick up and go on. But how many of you went out and picked your own mate? You picked the most beautiful woman or the biggest, strongest man, and you, what, God wasn't even a factor. <laughs> or, you know, it says, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And yeah, well, but they, they're, they look so nice. <laughs> God, I'm sure it'll work out. And so you go ahead and get married. And man, your marriage just turns out to be a mess. Because you know what? You didn't hear the voice of God. Jamie and I did a marriage seminar one time in Greeley, Colorado. And uh, it was with a group from Greeley. We went to Estes Park. And there was about, I don't know, 50, 60 people. There are 25 couples at least. And the guy who was doing it had everybody go around and tell about how they met. And it was revealing. The average story, it was something like I was drunk <laughs> I saw this woman who wasn't wearing anything and we woke up the next morning in bed together and that's how we got together. And that's the way that there was only one other couple besides Jamie and me who felt like God put us together. Now again, I'm not condemning anybody else that you came to it some other way. But I'm saying that most people see they just do it their own way and look at the divorce rate. Look how things don't work because we didn't let, we didn't hear God's voice. We pick and choose on our own. Again, I go back to Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23. I've already quoted that verse. But it says, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. God has given us the uh, freedom, the privilege 
of choosing our own way. He won't force His way upon you. God doesn't sovereignly make you do anything. And again, this is violating some people's religious doctrines because they're just taught that everything is of God and nothing happens but what God allows it. That's not what the Word of God teaches. Man, I could spend hours verifying that, but that's not true. God doesn't control you like a little pawn. You have a part to play in it. And so God has a purpose, a plan for your life, but you have to cooperate. It doesn't automatically come to pass. And one of the things, there's many things, but first of all, you can't act on what you don't know. You have to be able to hear God's voice. You have to hear God speak to you. You know, let me share this passage with you out of Numbers chapter 7. In verse 89, And when Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubs, and he spake unto him. And so this is saying, this is talking about the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant was a box and it was overlaid with gold. It was carried on these two staves. It went through these rings that held it up. And it was put inside of the holy place. And over the uh, Ark of the Covenant, it was what was called the mercy seat. And there were these two cherubs that had wings that faced each other and they touched in the middle. And this says that when he went in, God would speak to him from between the two cherubs off of the mercy seat, and he would hear that voice. You know, I've wondered sometimes about, was, was Moses hearing the voice of the Lord on the inside, or was it an audible voice? This verse right here makes it very clear that it was an audible voice, because it didn't come from the inside. It was coming from off of the mercy seat. He was hearing an audible voice from God. And I could literally spend an hour or two going through the first five books of the Bible talking about the things that God said to Moses. It was phenomenal. It was phenomenal what hearing the voice of God could do. Learn how to recognize when God is speaking to you by getting Andrew's complete teaching titled, how to hear God's voice. Once again, I'd like to encourage you to get this either CD or DVD set that was taken from our television programs on how to hear God's voice. This is absolutely essential. You are not going to go very far in your relationship with the Lord or in succeeding in the things He calls you to do if you can't clearly hear His voice. And the good news is you don't have to go without it. God wants to speak to you, so please get this series on how to hear God's voice. Andrew's complete teaching, How to Hear God's Voice, is available as a CD or DVD album for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get these products. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. How come we don't hear the audible voice of God today? Now, I, I believe it can happen, and some people have testified about hearing the audible voice of God. There's probably some people in here that have heard an audible voice from God. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I am saying it's rare today. It's not normal. I have never heard an audible voice from God. I have never seen a vision. You know, there's different kinds of visions. One, you can have a vision where your eyes are open and yet you're seeing into the spiritual realm and seeing things. I've had a vision where, not with my physical eyes, but in my mind's eye, God just shows me things. Like He showed me this auditorium. He showed me this. He showed me how He wanted me to do it. I saw all of this, but I didn't see it with my eyes, my physical eyes. I was seeing it in my heart. It was like a mental picture. I've had things like that happen. God can speak through dreams. 
You know, the Bible says old men dream dreams. I dream dreams all of the time. <laughs> it would be unusual for a week to go by and God not speak something to me in a dream. I'll dream, I dream a hundred things every night. It's hard for me to tell if I'm awake or asleep because I'm, my mind's going, I'm dreaming the whole time. So I guess I'm officially an old man. I dream <laughs> dreams. Except I've been doing it since I was a teenager. <laughs> so I don't know. But anyway, I believe that God can speak in those things, but it's not common. It's not normal. The vast majority of the people in here, if I, if I was to ask you to raise your hand, the vast majority of you in here have not heard an audible voice from God. And yet Moses heard an audible voice from God. And the scripture says uh, that what we have is so glorious that it makes what Moses had. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and it uses Moses specifically as an example that it makes what he had have no glory in comparison to what we have. It says over in Peter, it says that these people who wrote these scriptures, they were searching diligently and looking for the day that they were prophesying about when they were writing about us in the New Testament because they longed to have what we have. Did you know Moses would give anything to have what you and I have? And yet, I'm sitting here thinking about Moses heard the audible voice of God. God talked to him every time he went into the tabernacle. I'd like to have some of that. And yet it says what we have is better. And I was meditating on this, and here's the answer, I believe, to this. That you know what? The Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant were in the temple. And God spoke to them from off of the mercy seat from between the cherubs. Did you know that today we are the temple of the Lord? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Your body is the temple of the Lord. Twice it says that. So now the Holy of Holies isn't in heaven someplace. It's in us. And God himself lives inside of you. And now follow me and think about this. God isn't speaking to you from the outside in the way he spoke to Moses. You now have the holy place, the temple on the inside of you. God speaks to you from the inside out. And this is why most people aren't discerning the voice of God is because they are trying to connect with God and hear his voice in some physical, tangible way, some carnal way. People will sit there and say, God, if you want me to come to Bible college, well, then just sell my house. Send the buyer by. Make things happen. God, if you want me to do this, have two cats walk this way and one dog <laughs> walk that way. God, write it in the heavens. Let me see something. And they're looking for some physical, natural way of contacting him. And yet God speaks to you spirit to spirit. Look at this passage of Scripture over in Romans chapter 8. This goes right along with what I'm saying. In verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Did you know the Greek word for flesh here is sarx, S-A-R-X. And it literally means of the five senses. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, you could say after your senses, after just feeling, but instead you walk after the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Man, that is one powerful scripture. The word flesh is not a word that we use a lot. If, if you just say flesh to the most people, they're thinking of it like skin. But the word flesh in the Bible there's times that it will talk about the flesh of an animal. That would be talking about the skin of an animal. But in this context, in Romans chapter 8, it's talking about your carnal self. The part of you that's not born again. The part that hasn't been changed. Your mind, your will, your emotions. What you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. 
that physical, carnal, natural part of you, the part that most people call the personality. And so this is saying, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. You know how you can tell whether you're in the flesh or in the Spirit? People will sit there and they, it's because you put on a robe. You dress a certain way. You turn your collar around backwards and that makes you spiritual. Or you get some sick look on your face and you go around in this anemic uh, <laughs> attitude. You know, you see these pictures of Jesus with his hands like this. going, <laughs> Looks effeminate. And they think that that is... That's spiritual, or you go around with your hands folded, or they just have all of these weird ideas about what being in the Spirit is. Jesus said this in John 6, 63, It's the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Being in the Spirit is being in the Word. Being in the Spirit, being after the Spirit is following after the Word, doing what the Word of God says, letting your life be controlled by the Word. So plug all of that back in. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. If your mind is stayed upon the physical, natural realm, if that's where you live, if that's what dominates you, you are carnal. You are in the flesh. You're after the flesh. That's profound right there. That's powerful. A lot of people take offense at this, but what are you occupied with? If the doctor says you're going to die, and if you sit there and it just begins to break your heart, man, you're going to die. You know, again, I love you. I'm not criticizing you, but you know what the problem is? You're after the flesh. You are... You are Letting the flesh, the report, the things that you see, what you feel in your body, you're letting it dominate you instead of God's Word. God's Word says, I will not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. By His stripes I was healed. If I was healed, I am healed. No plague will come nigh my dwelling, that I have power. I had a man come to me not long ago, and he says, I know what the Word says, but I just am powerless to do anything about it. And the Lord spoke to me, and he says, uh, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of your tongue. You got power right here in your tongue. But if you are letting what the doctor says, what the lawyer says, what the banker says, what your mate says, what circumstances say, if those things are dominating you, if that's where your mind is, then you are after the flesh. And just keep reading about what being after the flesh does. In verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. It didn't say that it tends towards death. Sometimes it causes death. No, it's carnal mindedness equals death. If you are thinking just naturally, you don't have to think sinful. You know, this is one of the things that I have uh, that I disagree with the NIV translation on because the NIV translation here will talk about the sinful mind. And that's not 100% wrong, but it's not 100% right. You don't have to be sinful in your thoughts. You don't have to be thinking demonic things. Just be carnal, be natural, thinking like a mere human being. Approach God saying, oh God, I'm only human. That's carnal. You aren't only human. If you've been born again, one-third of you is wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. you got the power of God living on the inside of you, and it's wrong for you to sit there and just approach your problems as, well, God, I'm only, a, I'm only a person. I'm only a man or a woman. What can I do? You've already operated in unbelief in your carnal because in the spirit realm, you're identical to Jesus. Your spirit is the same as Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. It doesn't mean one in the sense that there's two of you closely joined together. It means one, a singular one to the exclusion of another. You are one. Your spirit is identical to Jesus. 1 John 4, 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is... Speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world. So are you in this world. 
That's not true about your physical body. It's not true about your personality, your soulish realm. But in your spirit, you're identical to Jesus. You got his power. And for you to sit there and think, well, God, I know you can heal. Would you please heal me? And then you try and contact God through some physical, emotional way. You want to hear an audible voice. You want to have a feeling of heat or something flow through your body. You're wanting someone to come and prophesy and call your name. You know what all that is? It's carnal. Amen. <laughs> let me use another. I'm not through. I'm headed somewhere here. <laughs> but let me use another example to help you get this. Keep your finger here. Let me read this verse to you out of Proverbs chapter 4. In Proverbs chapter 4 and in verse 20, it says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. It says, incline your ear. To my sayings. What does that mean? Does that mean you're supposed to tilt your head? <laughs> what this is talking about, did you know the word incline right here? I can't pronounce it in the Hebrew, but it means to prick up the ears. And what it's talking about, if you've ever had horses or we've got deer at our place, and if you've ever noticed a horse or a deer, they'll hear things and their ears will rotate nearly 360 degrees, and they will cup those ears. Like when I was riding a horse, you know, a horse could be having his ears uh, pointed forward when you're riding him, and then you say something, and man, that, that horse will cock one ear and turn it to listen to you. They prick up the ears. They are inclining their hearing. They are tuning their hearing to something, trying to figure out what's going on. And this is saying that you have to tune your hearing to hear God. So here's another example. It's just like radio. Did you know right now there's radio signals in this room? And if you say there aren't, well, and why, why aren't there? Because I can't hear them. That doesn't mean that they aren't here. They are here. They, you just can't see them. But there are radio signals. Matter of fact, I'm using a wireless mic. Did you know it's sending a signal back there and they pick it up and then rebroadcast it? There are radio signals in here, but you have to tune your thing to hear that. Did you know most of you, or many of you in here are too young to remember this, but back when I was a kid and radio came out, did you know that the radio frequencies, they fluctuate? And back a long time ago, you could have your radio on and tuned to a dial and it would begin to start fading and you'd start getting some static and you'd have to adjust it and tune it. Now they've got things that electronically just keep it tuned in and focused on that frequency as it fluctuates like this. But radio signals fluctuate and you have to tune and you have to follow that. It would be similar to somebody broadcasting and yet you're on a different frequency. And if you're on a different frequency, even though they're broadcasting, you aren't going to hear them. What I'm saying is that God is broadcasting 100% of the time. He speaks to you 24 hours a day. Every time you need anything, God is always speaking to you, but we are on a different frequency. If you are in the flesh, you are tuned to a different fre frequency. If you are focused on just what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel, you're looking for God in an area that He doesn't operate in. Now, He can and God loves us so much that every once in a while He'll just break into your frequency to get your attention. But the vast majority of time, He's trying to bring you up to His level. He's trying to get you to start inclining your ear so that you could hear His voice. He doesn't want you to stay carnal. You know, the Lord could have a bird come sit on your shoulder every morning and talk to you and tell you exactly what you need to do and everything you need to do. He could have a dog walk up to you and bark out instructions. He had a donkey talk to Balaam. He can do all of that. He has done things like that, but those are the exceptions. But I'm telling you, if you are born again, God is speaking to you in the Holy of Holies off of the mercy seat 24 hours a day. But the problem is we are in the flesh 
and the flesh is not tuned to God's frequency. Back in Romans chapter 8, let me go back to verse 6. For to be carnally minded, to be focused in trying to relate to God and communicate with Him through some physical mean, you're wanting an audible, visible thing. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means it's the enemy of God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And then in the next verse, in verse 8, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you are in the flesh, you cannot please God. Again, Psalms chapter 35, verse 27. It's your, uh, God delights in the prosperity. He has pleasure in the prosperity of His servant. So if you aren't prospering, God's not pleased. If you're in the flesh, you can't please God. It's being in the flesh to be poor. I'm not saying that you're a sinner. I'm not saying that God hates you, but you aren't walking in the Spirit. You aren't receiving. God wants you to prosper. He wants to meet your needs abundantly. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness, and on and on it goes. There's a lot I could keep saying about this. But you know, a scripture that really touched my life back probably 50 years ago, or maybe 48 years ago, I was reading in Acts chapter 9, and it talked about the conversion of the Apostle Paul, and he was on the road to Damascus, and God appeared unto him with a blinding flash of light. He went blind. He heard an audible voice speaking to him. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he fell to the ground. Anyway, he went into Damascus, and in Acts chapter 9, I believe it's around verse 10, there was a man named Ananias who was praying. And as he was praying, the Lord said, Ananias. And Ananias said, Behold, I am here. And then he told him to go into a street called Straight, gave him the name of the street, and ask for a man named Saul and go lay hands on him because I'm separating him under the gospel and I want to show him how he's going to go to the Gentiles and how many things he'll suffer for his sake. And anyway, the, the point that really stuck out to me, the Lord just spoke to me and he said, you know what? He wasn't the first person that I talked to. Ananias is never mentioned in Scripture again. He wasn't one of the leaders of the church in Damascus. He wasn't the pastor. He wasn't an elder. The Lord was saying that, you know what? He he's probably spoke to somebody else, but they weren't listening. But when he said, Ananias, Ananias said, Behold, I am here. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Andrew, how many times have I talked to you and you weren't there? You weren't paying attention. You were on the wrong fre frequency. You were in the flesh, minding the things of the flesh, and you couldn't hear me speak. And brothers and sisters, I can guarantee you, this is true of all of us. God is trying to speak to you, not only to bless you personally, but God wants to use you to be a blessing. God wants to do great things through your life. God has never made a piece of junk. He's never made a dud. God's never made a failure. It is not God's will for any person in here to fail. God's plans for you, His thoughts towards you are thoughts of peace and not of evil. God's plans for you are so awesome that, man, it ought to just be overwhelming you. But that is not the typical Christian's experience, not because God hasn't planned it, not because God isn't trying to communicate it, but because we don't hear God's voice, we lean unto our own understanding, and we get into trouble. So I'm telling you, hearing the voice of God is phenomenal. I couldn't even tell you how many times, God, I've heard him speak to me. I, I couldn't tell. I'd just be making a guess, but I know it's thousands, maybe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. God speaks to me all of the time. 
You know, I remember going to one of our board meetings, and it was back in one of those years where the Broncos won the uh, Super Bowl. And I went to the board meeting in February, and somebody had given me a Super Bowl hat with the Broncos. And anyway, I'm not a great football guy. I mean, I watched some of it, but it didn't matter that much to me. And I just, the Lord spoke to me, and he says, there's somebody that would really like to have that hat, and I'm going to show you who it is. So I went to that board meeting, and one of my board members saw me wearing that hat, and he says, I have tried to get one of these hats. My, he came from somewhere else. I forgot where he was living at the time, but he said his son says, make sure you get one of those Super Bowl hats when you're out there. And he says, I've been to every store in town, and they're sold out, and I can't get one of those hats anywhere. And I said, here you go. God told me that I, that's the reason I wore it. I don't normally wear a hat, but God told me. And it just blessed that man so much to think that God would consider him. That's a small thing, but you know what? That's God speaking to me. God will tell you things like that. It's awesome. I remember uh, the man who was a mentor for me, Joan A. He just turned 90 years old. I just went to his birthday uh, last month and was with him. And um, anyway, Joe is the guy that got me turned on to the Lord, and we were so close. I used to stay at his house 10 hours a day. And uh, then I got drafted, and when I came back, the relationship was different. I think he probably enjoyed me not being at his house 10 hours a day. And <laughs> he was polite to me, but he didn't want to get back to where it was, and our relationship deteriorated. And then the guy who ordained me to the ministry, Joe hated him. And so since he, my, his enemy ordained me to the ministry, he just thought that I hated him too. So he broke off all relationship with me. And for 10 or 12 years, I had no relationship with Joe. And then I was just praying and God laid Joe on my heart. And I just knew that I was supposed to call him. I didn't have anything to tell him. I expected him not to talk to me. He hadn't talked to me in 10 years, but I just knew that God laid him on my heart. So I called his number, and it had been disconnected. And so what do you do? I knew his wife's maiden name, and I knew that she came from Longview, Texas. And this is back before we had cell phones and stuff. And what I did was call and get a phone book from Longview, Texas, and I looked up every Wilson in Longview, Texas, and I called every one of them and just started going through. Do you know Joe Ann? May, she used to be called Wilson. And anyway, I started calling. I probably called 20 or 30 Wilsons in Longview, Texas. And finally, uh, when I called, I said, uh, do you know Joanne May? And it was Joanne that had answered the phone. She was at her parents' house. And she said, this is Joanne. I said, this is Andy Womack. And she hung up the phone. <laughs> and I thought, well, that was really great. And I was just sitting there looking at this phone, thinking, God, I don't know what else I can do. I said, I finally found, and anyway, the phone rang and she called back and she says, I'm sorry I hung up, but she says, you were the last person I wanted to talk to. But uh, she, she, her husband had just quit the ministry. He was back to selling paper. He had gotten mad at God and said, I don't want anything to do with God. And he had left the ministry and they lost their home. That's the reason their phone had been disconnected and they had to move in with her parents. And she was just sitting there praying and saying, God, you're God. And even though we don't even live in the same house, even though we don't have the same phone number, you're God. You, I've traveled the world trying to help people. You could have somebody call me. I need help. God, send somebody, anybody. And as she was praying, I phone, phone, and got her. And it shocked her so much she hung up the phone. But anyway, we made the connection, and she says, please call back when Joe gets home. He'll be home at 5. So I started calling at 5, and I called every 10 minutes until midnight, and the phone was busy. For you millennials, you could take the phone off of the hook. 
and it would act like somebody was on the phone. It was busy. And so anyway, he took the phone off the hook and I guess at midnight he figured I'd probably give up. And so he put the phone back on the hook and within a minute after he hung up the phone, I called <laughs> and got him and started talking to him. And anyway, God used me to help get Joe back in the ministry. And man, he just loves me and we have a great relationship. But you know what? That was the voice of God that spoke that to me. How many people do you pass every day that God knows exactly what's going on with them. And if you were just listening to his voice, God would tell you, just go give this person a hug or go say hi to this person or, or give this person five bucks or do something to bless them. What would your life be like if you could just hear God and be like Jesus? He said, the works that I do shall you do also. What would it be like if you could just walk by and say, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to go eat at your house today. That's not just for Jesus. That's for all of us. Those aren't just gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's a different thing. I'm not talking about a person that has a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning the spirits, etc. I'm just talking about Joe Blow, Jane Doe Christian. You were supposed to be able to hear the voice of God. What would it be like if you could have God just speak to you and tell you exactly what your purpose is, exactly how to accomplish it? Go here, do this. Talk to this person. Amen. What would it be like? Great. Great. Amen. <laughs> I believe that that's what I'm going to be talking about this week, and I'm going to help you do that. And I'm not even going to ask how many of you want this. Everybody should want this. Thank you for watching the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Wong. Praise the Lord. All right, so I've got a teaching that they advertised last night entitled How to Find, How to Follow, and How to Fulfill God's Will. And I actually have six hours worth of teaching on how to find God's will. I covered it in one hour last night. Then I've got six hours worth of teaching on how to follow God's will. That's what I'm going to talk about now. And then I've got six hours worth of teaching on how to fulfill God's will. So I've got 18 hours worth of teaching in just that one series and that doesn't even come close to covering everything that you need to know about vision. That series on Elijah is really, really good on that. And then I, that series on uh, the four keys to hearing God's voice is really good. You've got to be able to hear God's voice. That's what Pastor Dwayne has been talking about <clears throat> this morning and, and this afternoon. What I want to do this afternoon, I'm going to talk about uh, it's not enough just to know what God's will is for your life. That's absolutely essential, but that's only a first step. Then you've got to figure out how does he want you to accomplish it? And there's also a timing to the things of God. And most people don't understand this. One of the reasons that God doesn't show you everything all at once is because if he did, we would not be patient we wouldn't follow him. We would try and do things premature and we would get out and mess the entire thing up. So he'll only reveal his will to you step by step as you're able to take it. You know, right now we have to have around $8 million a month just to pay our bills. And I need at least $5 million more than that. So right now we need over $10 million a month. If God would have put that on me 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I couldn't have handled it. But see, you just start taking steps, step by step by step, and I've taken all of these steps. Did you know this television ministry that we have that now reaches 5.2 billion people? I've been working on that since uh, 2000, January the 3rd, 2000. We started with 3% of the U.S. population, and I just started taking steps. And we've now built to where, you know, the billion dollars that we need to accomplish the instructions that God has given me, I've now got the foundation. I've, I've been doing things. I've been sowing into people's lives for 23 years, and therefore it's all logical how it's all going to happen. There's some people that are believing for large numbers of people, but in a sense it's like you're wanting to go to a bank and make a withdrawal, but you've never made a deposit. Did you know you reap what you sow? And if you are needing money, what have you sown towards this? 
Well, I'm sowing the gospel into people's lives. And the scripture says that if you preach the gospel, then it's appropriate for you to live the gospel. But if I preached to five people, it would be totally wrong for me to believe five people to provide me with a billion dollars. Now, it could happen. I mean, one person could give you a billion dollars, but it's not my experience. That's not how it works. Uh, very few people. I have a guy that uh, one of my staff went over to him in Singapore and he had just bought his 53rd boat that day for, I think it was $53 million. And he was a tanker and stuff. And he's a multi-billionaire, picked this, uh, his Wendell Parr picked him up in a Bentley limousine that was following his other Bentley limousine with all of his security in it. And Wendell went there and this guy is a, a super billionaire and listens to me and has received a lot from me. And he gave us a box of tea. <laughs> and it's a very nice box of tea. It's probably worth the uh, hundreds of dollars. I don't know, but you know what? It could happen that way, but it's never happened that way for me. It's the people that are just giving the $20, $50 or whatever and things like that. And I believe that God would rather have a billion people give a dollar than one person give a billion dollars because that way he could bless a billion people instead of just one. Anyway, my point is, see, I've been making deposits and for 23 years I've built things up and now that I've made deposits, I can make a withdrawal. But there's some people that are wanting God to supply their needs. And have you ever blessed anybody? Have you ever sown into anybody's life? Have you ever done anything? You can't reap what you haven't sown. There's a lot of really practical things that go along with the stuff we're talking about. And uh, so anyway, my point is, even if you know what God's will is, He's not going to reveal it to you all at once. If you go from zero to a thousand miles an hour in one second, you die. That's a wreck. That's not acceleration. You have to start and just gain your momentum and build up to it. And there's a lot of people that you're just wanting God to show you a vision and all of a sudden, boom, from here, you will go from here to there in nothing flat. God won't do that because he loves you. It would kill you if he put that kind of responsibility, if he gave you the opening, it's not enough just to know what God's will is. You've also got to recognize there's a timing that's involved with it. There is growth and maturity that's involved. And also you got to figure out how God wants to accomplish it. And I want to use Moses as an example here to illustrate this. Let's look over in Exodus chapter two. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because this uh, most people have heard the story of Moses and how he was uh, supposed to be killed by Pharaoh, but instead he was put in a basket and he just supernaturally floated down the Nile River right to Pharaoh's daughter. She picked him up and raised him as her own son. So this is really neat how Pharaoh gave the order to kill all the male children and yet God worked it out so that Pharaoh raised the one who was going to destroy Pharaoh and had him pay for all of that. That's pretty awesome. And so it was miraculous. Uh, and then when he was full 40 years old, I'm going to turn to some other scriptures because if all you do is read in Exodus, you miss a lot of the information. Acts chapter seven and Hebrews chapter 11 are really where you get a lot of the information about Moses and people have only read this. Cecil B. DeMille's made the movie, The Ten Commandments, and he based it on this, and it also says in the credits that he went to Jewish rabbis, which of course did not read Acts and Hebrews. They didn't believe in that. And they came to totally wrong conclusions. And sad to say, most Christians probably are more influenced by the movie, The Ten Commandments, than you are by the Word of God. Most people believe that Moses, just like in the movie, The Ten Commandments, he was just a nice guy that went out and saw a Hebrew that was being oppressed by an Egyptian and killed him not knowing anything. That's not what the word of God says. He knew that he was a Jew. He supposed. Are y'all familiar with Exodus chapter two? Let me turn over here and read this to you out of Acts chapter seven. Let me read to you what the New Testament says. This is Stephen under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Right before he got stoned to death, he saw the heavens open 
and saw Jesus standing at the Father's right hand and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he said these things under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he was giving a history lesson on the Jewish people and it says in verse 22, Acts 7, 22, it says, and Moses was learned. Well, let me just back up and read the whole thing about Moses in verse 20. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Moses told God over in Exodus chapter four, God, I can't speak. I'm not eloquent. This says that he was mighty in words and in deed. That was just a con. It's just like many of us when God tells you to do something. Oh God, I can't do that. And then it says, and when he was a full, full 40 years old, this is the only place in scripture that shows you he was 40 years old when he went out and killed the Egyptian. And so it says when he was full, full, 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brother and the children of Israel. That shows you that this was something God put in his heart. This didn't just happen. It wasn't happenstance. He knew that he was a Jew. Matter of fact, his own mother was hired by Pharaoh's daughter to nurse uh, Moses until uh, he quit nursing. And you know, back in those days, it wasn't unusual to nurse for two or three years. I've actually got a friend that was nursed until he was five years old. And I can guarantee you that she told him who he was. He knew that he was a Jew. And so it came into his heart to go visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them wrong, he uh, defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian for he supposed his brethren would, uh, would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. So this shows you that he knew he was a Jew. He knew he was the one that God had anointed to bring deliverance to the Jews. So he knew God's will for his life. Some people think, well, if I know God's will for my life, then that solves everything. No, Moses knew God's will, but he was ignorant of the timing and of the way that God was going to do it. And so it's not enough just to know what God's will for your life is. You've got to recognize there's other things involved. So he supposed his brethren would have understood that God would use him to bring this deliverance. And you know, I suspect that most of us probably would have made the same mistake that Moses made. Because think about this. He was destined to be killed is what the order of Pharaoh was, and yet he wasn't killed. And not only did he survive, but he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter in Pharaoh's home. I've actually read in commentaries, there are secular accounts that Moses was one of the greatest generals that Egypt ever had. And he went and conquered the Lubiums and he brought back in such spoil. There was never as much spoil ever brought into Egypt as what Moses did. And that is depicted in that movie, The Ten Commandments, if you've ever seen that, where they have all the peacocks and all the people come dancing in. And that is a historical fact. So Moses not only survived, but he was raised in Pharaoh's household. He became second or third in command. He was a great general. He was a military guy that defeated people. How could all of these things just happen to somebody who was supposed to die? It would have been easy to just say, no wonder God saved my life. He put me in this position so that I, by my power, by my might, by my position, I'm going to bring the deliverance to the Jews. He knew God's will for his life, but he didn't have a clue on how God was going to do it. God wasn't going to do it through military might. He was going to do it through these mighty plagues that came on every God that the Egyptians worshiped. It was going to bring those people to their knees. I guarantee you there's many, many, many Egyptians that turned to the Lord, I'm sure, as they saw all of these things happening. So he knew what God's will for his life was, but he just supposed God was going to use his talents his ability, his natural things. How else could a Jew have become second or third in command of the entire nation of Egypt? It all made perfect sense, but it was wrong. And likewise, there are some people probably right here that think, oh man, God, no wonder. I, I can see why you chose me. What a wise choice. Look at all of my great talents and abilities. Did you know you have to come to the end of yourself before you be find the beginning of God. God is not going to anoint your flesh. 
You need to learn how to walk in the spirit and you have to come to the end of yourself. And Moses was thinking that God was going to use him. And so he went out and actually justified killing a person thinking that he was bringing God's will. Did you know when you get into yourself and looking at yourself and thinking and leaning under your own understanding, it's amazing the things that you can justify and come up with. But this was never God's plan. So he missed the way God was going to do it. He just assumed God had put him in this position and given him all of this clout because that was how God was going to do it. He totally missed the way God was going to do it. And let me also show this to you over here in Genesis chapter 15. Pastor Dwayne was there just a few minutes ago sharing about Abraham coming out of his tent and looking up to the heavens. But let me show you this in Genesis chapter 15. This is where the Lord had told him, go out and see now the stars and number them. And if you can number them, so shall your seed be. And then he told him, uh, he, he cut this covenant with him. And I hadn't got time to go through all of that. But he had Moses kill these animals, separate the pieces. And the way they made a covenant, people would walk between it. Well, Moses killed the animals and he stayed until evening driving all of the fowls away, all of the birds that would have come and have eaten the sacrifices. And at uh, even time, there was a smoking lamp and a burning furnace that walked between the pieces. And there's a lot of symbolism here, but that's, that's God walking between these pieces. He cut a covenant with Abraham. This is quoted over in Genesis chapter 3 and many, many other places it's mentioned in the New Testament, he said that this is where God counted his faith to him as righteousness. And Romans chapter four makes a big deal out of this, that this is when Abraham was justified in the sight of God, because God said, if you can count the stars, so shall your seed be. And he believed, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, verse six. And then he went on and prophesied that uh, down here in Genesis chapter 15, and in verse 15, he says, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down was when all of this burning uh, uh, lamp and smoking flax, I needed to back up. Into verse 13, he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. Man, I hadn't got time to verify this, but, and some of you will disagree and you're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. <laughs> the children of Israel were only in Egypt a maximum of 120 years. They did not spend 400 years there. And you can prove that over in Genesis chapter four when it talks about uh, that it was, anyway, it was exactly to the day, 430 years after this promise is when they came out of the land of Egypt. If I had time, I could prove that to you. But the reason I'm bringing this out is to say that when the Lord said that it was gonna be 400 years from this covenant before I bring your children out of this land, did you know if you add all of this up, Moses missed the timing of the Lord? Because again, if you continue to read over here in Acts chapter 7, let me go back and just continue reading here. It says and, uh, in verse 26, and the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. You know, again, for time's sake, if I could turn to Hebrews chapter 11, it says that he fled Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. If you just read it here or if you read it in Exodus, you would come up to the fact that he feared the king. But it says he fled, not fearing the wrath of the king, because he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, I'm not saying that he wasn't aware that Pharaoh wanted to kill him, but it was more of a strategic retreat. He knew that he had messed up something had happened. He didn't fear just totally out of, he didn't flee totally out of fear. He fled because he knew that he had messed things up. And 
contrary to that movie, The Ten Commandments, he wasn't in the desert trying to forget God and get away from this. It says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And the word endure is not a passive word. It's an active word. And he was holding on to the word of God and believing that somehow God choosing him to be the one that would bring deliverance to the Jews was still going to happen. He was not avoiding God. And you can see that over in Hebrews chapter 11. I hadn't got time to read that. But it says in verse uh, 27, Acts 7, 27, he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away saying, who made thee a ruler or a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. And when 40 years were expired, again, this is the only place in scripture that shows you is 40 years again. So he's 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. He was 40, he was 80 years old when uh, the Lord appeared unto him in the burning bush that's listed in uh, Exodus chapter three. And so it says, when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight and he drew near to it. And behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him saying, I'm the God of thy fathers. And he had sent him there. The reason I'm reading all of this is to show you he was 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian. And then he spent 40 years in the wilderness. And let me read one last scripture before I make a point here in Exodus chapter 12. And in verse 40, this is talking about when they finally had brought Egypt to their knees then it says in Exodus twelve forty. now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that the host of the Lord went out of the land of Egypt. Notice it wasn't just any day. It was exactly 430 years to the day after that covenant of Genesis chapter 15. And again, Galatians chapter four makes it clear that, uh, that all of that time wasn't spent in Egypt. There was a maximum of 120 years. They were strangers in the promised land and didn't have any inheritance except the burying place for Abraham had for uh, his wife, Sarah. So anyway, my point is 430 years to the day. And yet the prophecy was that they would be there for 400 years. So there's a discrepancy here. If you subtract the 40 years that Moses spent in the wilderness back to when he killed the Egyptian, you know what this means? He was 10 years early trying to bring deliverance to the Jews. Now that is really significant because God had given his word. It was going to be 400 years. He tried to do it in the 390th year. So he not only missed the way that God was going to do it, thinking that God was going to use him because of his position and clout that he had, and he was relying upon himself instead of relying upon God, but he also was 10 years premature. And we don't know for sure that he knew the prophecy of Genesis chapter 15, but I suspect that he did because the Jews were really strong on passing down their history and things like this. And it's very possible that if he knew that the prophecy was 400 years and it was only the 390th year, he could have justified it talking about, look how many Jews die every year with their prayers unanswered. Look how many people are being oppressed. See, this is the logic that a lot of people use today. We actually had a student that came here and he said that the Lord told him that he was going to lead 1 million people to the Lord. And so I was teaching on this very thing and he stood up in the midst of class and rebuked me. And he says, you're saying that there's a certain time and we got to do it now. And he gave the statistic on how many people are dying every single day and going to hell because they've never heard the gospel. And you're saying that we need to wait and prepare ourselves and let God be the one that opens up the doors and promotes things. And he got mad and he actually wound up quitting school and leaving school. And I've never heard from him since, but I can guarantee you if he had led a million people to the Lord, I'd have heard of it. <laughs> Preparation time is never wasted time. But see, there's a lot of people that they, they say, well, I know that the scripture says not to put a novice in a position of authority. And yet we do it all of the time. We take people who are sports figures 
people who are entertainers or whatever, and they get converted and we eat, uh, automatically put them on all of the talk shows and use them as an example of Christianity. And nobody is born again mature. You know, one person that I heard testify about this was B.J. Thomas. And many of you young people won't know who B.J. Thomas is. But he was a famous singer back in, I guess, the 60s or 70s. He's the one that wrote and sang uh, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head and stuff like that. And anyway, he had a dramatic conversion to the Lord. And I mean, within a week or two, he was on the 700 Club. He hit all of the circuits and they began to start using him as an example. I think that... Uh, Modern uh, comparison to this would be uh, Keon, Keon, Keon West or Kanye West. I've just heard about this. I don't even know what the guy looks like. But I, anyway, I've heard that he's supposed to be a born again Christian and things like that. And yet the guy has come up with so many weird stuff and things that make you wonder if he's even born again. But did you know that Joel Osteen had him speak at his church? People put him on television and begin to use him because he was famous. But the scripture specifically says, don't put a novice in a position of leadership. And people avoid that all of the time because after all, look how important this is. Look how many people could be reached through this. And I believe that Moses could, anyway, I didn't finish my story about B.J. Thomas, but B.J. Thomas became popular and did all of the circuit. And then he started saying some things that were wrong. And when he said these wrong things, the Christians turned on him and trashed him because he was saying things that weren't scriptural. And anyway, he wound up getting mad and fighting against the Christians and coming out. And it was 20 or 30 years later that I heard him say that he shouldn't ever have been made a spokesman for the Lord. He didn't know what he was talking about and he made mistakes and Christians turned on him and he just defended himself and it was, and he's, he repented. I don't even know if B.J. Thomas is still alive or not. But anyway, he repented of it and things like that. But it happened because they were just, they were looking at, look how many people we could reach right now because this person is popular. That's not the way that God does things. And Moses could have been thinking, God, I know it's still 10 years, but let, let's just suppose that there's 10,000 Jews dying per year under slavery. And if we wait another 10 years, then that's going to be 100,000 Jews that die without their uh, prayers being answered. And so he could have just thought, I don't care. I'm going to microwave this miracle. <laughs> Amen. And he tried to make it come to pass. See, this is what we tend to do. We are impatient. We want to make things come to pass, but there is a timing. You know, in my own life, the Lord touched my life, March the 23rd, 1968. He called me to minister and he gave me the uh, understanding that I'd be reaching people all over the world. I knew that back when I was 18 years old, but it was 32 years later when I started on television and it was uh, 31 years just before I started on television that the Lord woke me up at 3.05 in the morning and said, you're just now starting your ministry. 32 years later, and he says, when you start on television, you're just starting your ministry. Man, that was not encouraging in one sense to think that for 32 years I'd been ministering and yet it, was, it wasn't even my ministry. But then on the other hand, I'd already seen great things happen. We had seen great miracles and People's lives changed. And if all of that was just preparation, well, then that was encouraging to think it was going to get better. But 32 years preparing me, it doesn't have to take you 32 years. That's the reason we have Karis Bible College is to teach you all of our mistakes and so that you don't have to be as dull as I was. But nonetheless, see, there was a timing. And I was frustrated during that time because I kept constantly trying to reach the whole world. I knew what my vision was, but there was a timing to it. And I don't believe that God's got a certain date circled on a calendar that, you know, uh, for me, it was January the 3rd, 2000. That's when my ministry started, when I started on television. No, he didn't have a date circled on a calendar. He was just waiting on me to grow and mature to a place that I could handle things. So there isn't a certain date like that, but there are certain things that have to be accomplished in your life before God will promote you and put you in a position because he loves you. He, when you get 
put in a position of leadership, I guarantee you Satan is going to unleash all of his weapons of hell against you. And if you aren't mature and if you can't handle it, it would destroy you. And God loves you more than that. God loves you more than he loves what you can accomplish for him. So he is not going to promote you. He's not going to open up all of the doors if you aren't able to handle it. And yet we constantly are trying to make what God wants us to do come to pass in our own timing. I tell you, you need to be, you need to be careful about trying to kick the doors open and force things to happen. And there's a balance between this because you can become passive too to where, where you're just waiting on God. No, God's waiting on you, but he's not waiting on you to kick the door down. He will open the door for you, but he's waiting on you to mature and grow to a place that you are usable. Like I shared last night, I was praying and saying, God, use me, God, use me. And he said, the reason I don't use you is because you aren't usable. Quit praying, God, use me and pray, God, make me usable. So you still have to be active. You have to be aggressive seeking the Lord, but not in your own might. You're aggressive seeking the Lord and just making yourself available. So anyway, Moses missed the timing of God by 10 years and it cost him 40 years in the wilderness. People often say, like for instance in that movie, The Ten Commandments, you know, Moses starts out into the desert and the announcer, the narrator comes on in this awesome voice, which I haven't got. But he comes on and says, and so he heads into the desert where prophets and you know where snakes and scorpions are and prophets are and it makes it sound like this was all God's doing to send him into the desert. God put him in the palace. If he'd have cooled his jets 10 years, he could have been in the palace and God would have used him. No, that wasn't God that sent him into the desert. That was Moses' self-will, the fact that he ran ahead of God that cost him 40 years in the desert and it cost the children of Israel 30 years extra bondage. God prophesied 400 years. They spent 430 years. So if you use the same logic that I was talking about, let's say that 10,000 people die per year in slavery and he was upset because that could have been 100,000 people in the next 10 years. Well, then how many died in 30 years? That would have been 300,000. Is that correct? My math's right. 300,000 Jews died that didn't need to die in slavery. If he would have been obedient to God, they'd have come out 30 years before. And who knows, maybe that generation would have been better than the generation that he brought out that disobeyed in the wilderness. Man, it, it messed things up big time. And brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, us leaning unto our own understanding, thinking, God, I can handle it from here. You've, you've given me a word. I'm going to make a paragraph out of it. I can handle it from here. That'll get you into trouble. And you not knowing the timing and you trying to force and to make things come to pass will ruin the entire plans of God. So it's vital that you have a word from God and that you know what God has called you to do. You need to have a vision, but then you not only need a vision, you need the patience to let God work in you and do the things that need to be done. And you need to not depend upon yourself. You need to get to where you are dependent upon God. And nobody just comes into that immediately. It's a progression. You have to grow in it. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter four. And so again, if you were to take the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11, I don't have time to go there, but it says he endured as seeing him who is invisible and he was walking in faith. Moses wasn't running away from God 40 years in the wilderness. He was seeking God. I believe he was saying, God, I know what your calling is on my life. Give me another chance. I'll do it your way. I'll do anything. And so in the third chapter is where the Lord appeared unto him in a burning bush. Man, I hadn't got time to go into that, but did you know that in the desert, bushes burned all the time? That wasn't that unusual, but this bush was on fire and it wasn't consumed. And he made special mention, I'm gonna turn aside and see this great sight. Did you know if he would have just said, man, Zipporah's got supper waiting for me at home, I, I got to go home. I, I've seen a bur bush burn before. He could have walked on by. Why didn't God just call to him and say, Moses, why did he do this bush? 
God, he delights in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And he's not going to, he could come and arrest every one of us. He could have an angel come and with a flaming sword force you to do things, but that's not the way that God is. God will just reveal himself to you. Like when Jesus was walking on the water to his disciples, you know he was going out there to save them because they thought they were drowning. Matthew chapter 14. And yet Jesus just walked out on top of the very thing that was killing them. And it says that he made as though he would have passed by them. You know he was coming out to help them and yet he just kind of waved at them and <laughs> walking on by. And if they hadn't called out, he would have passed on by. Man, if it would have been us, we'd have come out there yelling, waving our arms, hold on guys, I'm coming. But you know, Jesus just presented himself. They had to call out. They had to make a demand on him. The Lord isn't going to force you to do anything. And so he just did something unusual that got Moses' attention. But if Moses hadn't have been seeking God, if he hadn't have been looking, he could have missed this encounter with the Lord. It was only after he turned aside. In Exodus chapter 3, in verse 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him. If he hadn't turned aside to see, God wouldn't have called unto him. He was looking for God, and when he saw something unusual, he thought, man, I wonder what this is, and he turned aside. And anyway, God told him five different times, you're going to go deliver the Jews. And Moses said, God, I can't do it. They won't believe me. It won't work. Contrast this with 40 years before where God just spoke to him, you are going to deliver the Jews, and he went out and in his own strength killed a man. He was self-willed. He was confident. Now, here he is 40 years later saying, God, it won't work. They won't believe me. He had come to the end of himself. He had, been, he had spent 40 years in Bush University <laughs> learning that, God, I've got to do it your way. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. You tell me and I'll do it your way. And so here's his final exam in chapter 4. In verse 1, and Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me. He had just said they will believe you. And he said, No, they won't believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Now remember that Moses for 40 years had been looking to God and saying, God, give me another chance. And yet here he was in the presence of God, hearing an audible voice from God, a visible manifestation of God. And yet when he saw this snake, he was forsaking it all. He was getting out of there. This shows you that he was not a snake handler. He's not one of these guys that was able to handle snakes. He was leaving the presence of God. And then it says, and the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. Did you know when you take up a serpent by the tail, that means you aren't in control. That snake could turn and bite you. As far as Moses was concerned, he hadn't written the last part of this verse yet. He didn't know that it was going to turn back into a rod. From his perspective, to pick up a poisonous snake by the tail means that snake could turn, bite him. It was like a death sentence. And yet Moses was willing to say, God, I'm going to obey you if it costs me my life. I will obey you if it's the death of everything that I've ever believed for. You've got to come to that place to where you aren't leaning under your own understanding before you can be usable. And if you would be honest, there's very few Christians that would do something that would cost you. Boy, you can see that during the COVID thing. There are so many people that came up and told me, I know that God told me not to take the vaccination. I know God told me not to do all of this weird stuff. And I say, well, don't do it. And they said, but they'll fire me. You hadn't come to the end of yourself. If you're going to sit there and not obey God because it's going to cost you your job, it's going to cost you financially, it's going to cost somebody rejecting you. For you to really be used to God, you got to come to a place to where the only person you're out to please is God. It was John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, that says, duty is ours, results are God's. And yet there's so many people, if I do this, look, this could be the consequence. I, can, I don't even relate to that. If God tells me to do something to the best of my ability, I'm going to do it. I don't care if it kills me. 
And some of you think, well, that's easy for you to say. Well, I've done it. I quit school. I lost a student to Furman. I got sent to Vietnam and they tried to kill me. I nearly died three times in one day in Vietnam. I put my life on the line and I'd do it again. I've done it before. I'd do it again. To the best of my ability, if I understand God, if he tells me to do something, I'll do it if it hair lips the devil. And until you get to a place that you will do that, you aren't fit to be used by God. So this was his final exam. God said, what do you have in your hand? A rod. It was just a stick. It was just a stick. There's nothing special about it. You may feel like you aren't anything special. You're just a person. But you know what? If you lay your life down before God and if you'll pick it up by the tail, which may look like, man, I'm going to lose everything. There's people that think if they yield themselves to God, he's going to send you to the backside of Africa to live in a hut and you're going to be battling mosquitoes and pygmies and things like this. And, and you just think that the will of God is always bad. That's not true. But anyway, you have to pick up your life by the tail. You know, I did that. I'm not going to sp spend time about it, but I, I went through this exact same thing. God showed this to me 50 something years ago, what I'm sharing with you. And I had to pick up my life and say, God, I'll do whatever you want. And I still mean that. You know, if the Lord told me to turn this ministry over to somebody else and go do something else, I'd go do it. I'd go live in a grass hut in Africa if that's what God wants me to do and let somebody else take this over. I might not have Jamie with me. <laughs> but I'd do it. And I'm sincere about that. This isn't my ministry. I'm just trying to obey what God told me to do. But I'm not... I'll do anything. This is what he was asking Moses to do. Pick it up by the tail. And when he picked it up by the tail, it turned back into a rod. And did you know if you would have sent that, if you'd have taken a shaving off of that rod and sent it to a lab to get a report, they would have said, well, that's just hickory or oak or, you know, whatever wood it was that he had. They wouldn't have seen anything supernatural. But if you go down to the 20th verse of this fourth chapter, after all of this encounter, it says in verse 20, And Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass and returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. In verse 2, it was just a rod. But now it is the rod of God. If he had hit a rock with that rod before, it would have either broken the rod or it would have just jarred him. But now he could hit a rock with it and water would gush out and feed over 3 million Jews and all of their animals. He could hold it out over the Red Sea and part it. He could hold it out over the Nile and turn it into blood. Hold it over the land and lice comes up. Hold it up and frogs come out. Let uh, hail come out of a clear sky and fire run along on the ground. Let darkness come over the land for three days. No sunlight for three days, but in all of the houses of the Jews, they had sunlight, not artificial light. They had sunlight in their house when it was totally dark outside. That's what the rod of God could do. It was God's rod. And it's the same thing. When you lay your life down before the Lord, he gives it back and other people will look at you and they'll still think that you're just the little brother or the sister or the person that's never been able to do anything. But between you and God, there's a covenant and you now have his authority and power and you can do things that are absolutely miraculous. And yet people will look at you. This is why your family rejects you because they remember you as a little brother or sister that had the runny nose. They wiped your bottom when you were a kid. They don't see you as a great man or woman of God. And this is why often our families are the ones that don't accept us because they see us differently. But man, when you give your life to the Lord, he gives it back to you and gives you supernatural authority and power and just for time's sake, I'm going to summarize some of this. But after they came out of the land of Egypt in the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus, God told Moses to go camp in a certain place where they had the Red Sea on one side, two mountains on the other side. It was like a box canyon. There was no escape. And he specifically said, Pharaoh, I'm going to harden his heart 
and he's going to say you're entangled in the land and he will see this as an opportunity to come and fight against you and I will destroy him. And the Egyptians who you see today, you'll see him again no more forever. So he set a trap for Pharaoh. And so sure enough, here comes Pharaoh. And when all of the Egyptians start coming, the Israelites see it. They panic and say, this is what we told you. We should have died in Egypt. They said, let's anoint an, uh, another leader to take us back and to make us slaves again. And Moses stood up and, and here's what he said in Exodus chapter 14 and in verse 13, Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So he knew that God had promised him victory and he made a great profession, said, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But look at the next verse down here. It says, and the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Man, I can think of great reasons why he was crying unto God. Here came the Egyptians with all of their armies and, and God said, why are you crying out unto me? He says, use the rod, take the rod. And you know what this is? I have invested my authority in you. I gave you power. And I'm convinced, I don't have time to convince you, but I am convinced that if Moses had just kept crying out, oh God, do something, God, do something, they'd have been overcome. He had to take the rod, the authority that God gave him, and he had to tell the people instead of stand still, he said, move forward, move towards the sea. And then he had to hold the rod of God out over the sea. And when he did, the sea parted and they went through, and of course the Egyptians were drowned in the sea. But God basically was telling, you know, this is things that we go through. Moses at one time was so self-willed, he was going to kill a man thinking that I can accomplish this. I can deliver the Jews on my own strength and power. He messed everything up, so he spent 40 years learning, God, I can't do it. And finally, the Lord had to give him these signs. He also had him put his hand inside of his uh, vesture and when he did it came out leprous and then he had him put it back in and it turned back to normal flesh and he had to convince Moses because Moses had lost all of his self confidence and he had to give him confidence that you now have the rod of God but then uh, he, he became very confident and did all of these things but then when he saw the Egyptians coming again here he is once again reverting to oh God do something and God saying now you do something I gave you my authority and power. So it looks like two opposites. Is it us? Do we take our authority? Do we make things happen or do we let God do it? It's both. It's not either or. If you ever get to where you are trying to make the things of God happen in your own strength and power, you will fail every single time. You'll mess it up and spend 40 years in the wilderness recovering from your own self-will. But if you get over here to where, oh God, you do something, you'll be killed by the Egyptians. There's a balance. And you've got to come to a place to where you have no confidence in the flesh. That's what P, uh, Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. We have no confidence in the flesh. There's many people that take teaching about righteousness, who you are in Christ, and all of these things, which I agree with 100%, but they don't understand that it's in your spirit that you've been made righteous. It's in your spirit that you're a born-again person. And they think that somehow or another their flesh is good. Your flesh isn't good. It doesn't matter if you have USDA choice flesh. Your flesh is still flesh. And if you are in the flesh, you cannot please God is what it says in Romans chapter 8. You can't please God. God is not pleased with your flesh. He isn't anointing you because you are a special person. He is anointing you because of who you are in the spirit, because of who he is on the inside of you. It's like the apostle Paul said, it's not me living, it's Christ living in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And yet so many people, they find out that they're righteous. They're no longer under condemnation and guilt. And so now they go to saying, I'm special. <laughs> well, you're special in your spirit, in your born again spirit. But I guarantee you, your flesh isn't special. And if you think that it is, you are just a great person for Satan to come and destroy because you will trust in yourself and you will get smug. And then when you do make a mistake and you will make mistakes, 
then you will just crash. Like, I thought I was better than this. You never get any, your flesh isn't getting better. The only thing that's getting better in your Christian life is you're getting more and more out of the flesh and into the spirit. But the moment you step into the flesh, your flesh is no better than it ever was. It's like flying in an airplane. You can say, man, look who I am. I'm flying at 40,000 feet, nearly 600 miles an hour. I'm awesome. You aren't awesome. It's that plane that's awesome. <laughs> and it's your position in that plane. You step out of that plane and see how long you fly. <laughs> it's the same thing. You don't ever get better. You don't get better. You get better at responding to the Lord, better at getting out of the way, better at letting God take control, but your flesh is still flesh. And if you ever get to where you are trusting in yourself and thinking that you're somebody awesome, that's the very thing that'll stop God from using you. You got to have your confidence in the Lord and who you are in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but I can't do all things. I am nothing without Christ is what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse five, but I'm never without Christ. But if somehow or another you could separate my flesh from my spirit, my, my flesh is nothing special. And it's easy for people to see that in me. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And when I say stuff like that, people, you couldn't, you shouldn't say things like that about yourself. That's because you like yourself too much. <laughs> I died to myself. I'm not, I'm not impressed with my flesh. Dwayne was talking about, you know, his looks, which you are a nice looking guy, but he said something about his looks, him and Sue, I've never been accused of being handsome. I've never had anybody come out and talk about things like, but it doesn't bother me because I am not living in my flesh. And therefore, because of that, when people criticize my flesh, it doesn't bother me. You know why some of you are so touchy? Because you love your flesh so much. Man, the Bible says, agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way. So when somebody comes and says, you're a, you're a zero, you're a nobody or something, I just agree with them. <laughs> Guilty on all counts, but praise God in Christ Jesus, I'm awesome. I can do all things through Christ. So I learn at Moses' expense that it's not enough just to know what God's will is. You got to know God's timing and you've got to know God's way of doing it. You've got to come to the end of yourself before you find the beginning of God. And you've also got to be patient and let God be the one who promotes you. There is a time to everything under heaven. So man, we are sharing some awesome things with you. What Pastor Dwayne shared today, these, these things would save you 40 years in the wilderness if you would understand it and operate in it. It'd be life changing. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let me have our prayer ministers come forward again. And if somehow or another God's touched you today, and if there's anything we can help you with, pray with you about, maybe some of you realize I went out and killed the Egyptian on my own. I have, I'm the one who drove me into the wilderness and you need to repent. Well, here's people that can pray with you and we'd love to help you any way we can. Amen. So do we have anything else before tonight's service? All right. So I think we're through. Let me just end in prayer. And if you need prayer with other people, come down here and let someone agree with you. So Father, we love you and thank you for these truths. Thank you, like it says in 1 Corinthians 10, that all of these things were written for our examples so that we could learn through them. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would take the things that Dwayne and I have talked about today that people would learn from it and that we could learn by their mistakes and not have to make the same mistakes. Father, I just thank you for the Holy Spirit teaching us and making this revelation to us. So we agree and we receive it and believe that this has got the power to save our souls. We agree and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll see you tonight at seven o'clock, right? Amen. You're dismissed. If you need prayer, come down here and let someone pray with you.